Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you take a moment to look down in the show notes for all the links that we're going to have from this episode, especially Porter Singer's links for her other podcast and her music that she does. We were lucky enough to interview Porter Singer. She's a local artist and and musician who also homeschools and unschools her two children. Yeah, we're doing a little unschooling streak here. We we talked with Lindsay Middlemiss about unschooling, and now we're talking with Porter. And it was a great interview. I really, I really enjoyed. I think I think the thing calming. (laughs) Yeah, the thing that we talked about, you know, I think after we 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 hung up with uh, Porter was that unschooling. I think we're starting to peel back that onion. Um, and hopefully you guys are getting that as well. And we're starting to see that unschooling is not abandoning your children. Like, you know, <laughs> not that feral, we ever thought that disclaimer, feral, we did feral creatures that. In, the, in the wild. <laughs> um, but we're starting to see that unschooling is, does not mean your kids are not taking classes. It doesn't mean your kids are not doing workbooks. It's not an abandonment of the idea of schooling. It's the, the allowing your children to pursue their interests and whatever way that might be. Right. And we were talking about this, you know, like for our daughter trying to figure out how we can be a little bit more, you know, open and unschool inspired, unschool inspired on, on certain topics and how would we, you know, proceed with that and how would we, you know, you know, fold that into what we're doing right now and what, what would we have to give up and what, what would have to be our mindset change? So it's really wonderful to talk to these parents who are doing this and then, kind of, you know, stimulating conversation in our own brains. I know we were just, uh, we were just chatting for like 10 minutes after this about, you know, some of our challenges and how would, you know, approaching these, you know, these educational principles and how to fold those into our daily lives and how would that like, you know, manifest in our, in our world just specifically. And yeah, because I I love the idea of unschooling and I, I love how natural it sounds as a natural extension of the way that we parent that we would then educate that same way. So exactly. I really love a lot of the principles and I want to find ways that we can incorporate. So hopefully you can listen to this interview with Porter and think about, you know, maybe there are ways that you can incorporate some unschooling mindset in your homeschool if, mm-hmm. or if it's something that intrigues you. Uh, I thought it was a, a just a really pleasant interview and she also homeschools part of the year out of the country. So there's a little bit of road schooling and how, you mm-hmm. know, you, you take your homeschooling uh, journey with you. So it was a really fascinating fascinating interview. We love talking to Porter. So hopefully you all enjoy this interview with Porter Singer. Hi, Porter. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, it's good to be here. Yeah. Well, well, it's exciting to meet you. Can you help our listeners learn a little bit more about you and your family and what got you all started in homeschooling? Yeah. So my beginning to homeschooling, I guess, was just observing one of my best friends um, who did end up going to a high school for part of her education, but was mostly homeschooled. And I just, I was always enamored by that. And I think that sort of stuck in the back of my head is like, homeschooling makes really cool kids (laughs) who don't seem to care as much about like (laughs) what other kids think about them. And so that was kind of like in my brain. But when I had my own kids, I don't know that I really anticipated homeschooling them from the get-go. Um, I had I had a rather traumatic birth with my first son, and that led me kind of to discover these podcasts about um, free birthing. And I think because of that algorithm, something uh, like it, it's sort of like, you know, when you look at certain things and then like YouTube or whatever platform you're on is like, what about this? You know, you seem to be interested in this. What about this? So um, I came across the idea of unschooling and I ended up listening to the full series podcast. I guess it was kind of like one of those podcasts that has a beginning and end, not like an interview every week, but like a 
just a goal. And I think it's just kind of there as like an encyclopedia for homeschooling. So I listened to that until it was done. (laughs) And it was like hours and hours. And I was so fascinated by it. It seemed really scary. Um, I had kind of been introduced to the concept of Waldorf before this. And so the idea of like unlimited screen time and uh, trusting, you know, your children to kind of navigate the world in a way that I hadn't been hearing from the modalities that I had been interested previous to that was quite new to me, but it also made sense because I was an attachment parent. So you know, in the sense that I let my kid kind of guide me through when they were ready to stop breastfeeding or, or, you know, well, that was kind of a collaborative decision, but yeah, um, we know, we know that collaborative decision, (laughs) (laughs) but everybody's, everybody's feelings count. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I, I uh, just decided to try it. And my son had been really fighting me on the limited, like, you know, whatever he was watching at the time, Babar or something. And it just, it was this constant struggle at like the age of two. And, and, and also like, I was like, I can't go anywhere without him seeing a screen. How do I do this? Yeah. You know? So I just, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to try this. And so I did kind of a, a trial period of a couple of weeks where honestly, we watched more TV than I think I ever have in my entire life. <laughs> But then he was kind of like, okay, that's boring. <laughs> and, and we kind of moved on. Not that they don't ever watch TV or, or play video games or whatever, but they, my, my comfort level with like, quote unquote, too much, or it kind of started from the screen thing. Honestly, that was like my big, my big concern. Everybody worries about that, you know, like, oh, are we going to melt our kids' brains? I I have to say, as a child of the 80s, I grew up on a lot of TV and I seem to be okay. As did I, yes. But I don't necessarily want that for my kids. The anecdote of it did not fry my brain, so therefore my kids' (laughs) brains are fine. Right. Um, My mom hit me, so I'm, yeah. Yeah, Um, I don't want to do that, but at the same time, I'm like, well, you know, some Disney movies and we enjoy that and I'm sure they're going to be okay. Totally. (laughs) It feels very conflicting as a mom, right, to go with what feels right, what your kids want to do. And then what, you know, everybody tells you, you should be doing. And like, you're talking about the attachment parenting. We had the same kind of thing where we just, it felt very natural to do the, the baby wearing and the nursing and all the things that, you know, felt right to us and the co-sleeping and all that stuff. But that was like, society was telling you that you should not do those things. I feel like sometimes it's that way with homeschool too. It just, it feels like this natural progression It is exactly kind of what you're saying. And, and the, but society kind of tells you that you shouldn't want to do that. Absolutely. It's difficult because no generation ever raises a generation that they're familiar with. Right. So yeah. how, you know, it's like, I don't know what it's like to grow up with YouTube. <laughs> I have have no idea what the, you know, what the consequences of that is, but I will say that something that has alleviated my anxiety level about it, because I've gone through so many phases of like reverting to, okay, I've just hidden all your tablets or like, or whatever, because it is scary. Like, I won't say that it's without anxiety. It is just noticing how like wonderful humans they are, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, okay, you may play more video games than I would have elected for you too, but you're also able to have conversations with adults that are meaningful and you're insightful about things and you notice things and you're empathetic and, you know, so I don't know it, that's at least a little comforting, I guess. Mm. So, so when you, you've committed to the unschooling methodology, you know, what does that look like? you know, in your day to day, like, how does that manifest? How do you plan for something like that? Or, you know, we have a lot of plan or don't plan. (laughs) We have a lot of, you know, we tend to skew a little bit younger in our podcast audience. And so Mm. a lot of people are familiar with unschooling. We've done a few interviews with them and some people are a little hesitant to go all the way. You know, the last person we interviewed, they said, there's a lot of different types of unschoolers. There's Mm. pure unschoolers and there's unschoolers, but math, you know, and, (laughs) you know, and so like, where do you fall into that spectrum and how do you, you know, execute that? Well, I think at its core, unschooling is basically trusting your children, right? Mm -hmm. So if your child really loves math workbooks, Mm -hmm. then that's totally part of their unschooling experience. It's not, unschooling is not the complete annihilation of anything that resembles school. It's just, 
you don't force it if it's not working or, you know, if it's, if it's not, um, pleasant, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. but I'm, I also have like a little caveat for my unschooling is nutrition. So I just, I could never get on board with the, if you let them eat junk, they'll soon discover that it's bad for them (laughs) because, (laughs) and the reason for this is because I feel like what your kids get used to taste wise actually endures for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my, that's like my, my, my sticky thing. I try to let my kids make informed decisions, but I also want to like bring up the fact that, you know, okay, my, my oldest has like a cavity thing, you know, like you just had a few cavities and you hate going to the dentist. So do you like sugar more than you hate going to the, you know, (laughs) and he's like, you know, no, I don't. So we found, you know, we found solutions. So it's not like a forbidden thing so much as like, Mm -hmm. you know, have that discussion, but you're asking me about structure. So one of the reasons that I chose unschooling was actually unrelated to the podcast that I listened to and the books that I ended up reading, just my own kid and the way that he kind of led me. And I noticed that any time I tried to like bring a workbook or like teach him something <laughs> that, you know, that I felt he needed to know, he was so repulsed by this. I mean, it, it was, it, it was like, he, he wanted to make it difficult for me. I was like, this doesn't feel right, mom. So I, I kind of, I, I kind of just adapted to what I felt like he needed in that moment. And it also happens to fit really well with my personality because I don't, and it's funny you said committed to home to unschooling. Cause I'm like, well, I'm not, you know, I, I commit to an extent, I guess, but you know, if, if at some point, if at some point I found something that seemed like a better option, I would definitely be open to that, you know, but for now this seems to be working. You know, with, with how you described it, that he's very reluctant. Do, would you imagine if you would have that type of reluctance in, in a traditional school? Well, so I have put him in a couple of um, schooling situations. And that so that was my other sort of like breaking point, because I thought when I first had him that I'd be conti- I would be able to continue to do the work that I was doing. I, I was working for a festival and I had like a lot of emails to answer and things like that. So I put him in a in a little preschool. And after about two weeks, maybe even like a week of like him just bawling mm-hmm. <laughs> through the whole thing. You know, the teacher was like, I don't think this is working out. And I was like, yeah, I don't think so either. So, you know, change of plans. Okay. I I'll, I'll change, I'll change my thing. I will completely devote my time to him. Then a year later, I tried again. I put him in this really cute little Waldorf preschool. They made bread and soup. I mean, it was so cute. It could not have been better, but he also hated that. And the thing that he was hating was just being away from me. Mm. And I think that that's something that we have to consider too, is that certain children just like are much more attached in the beginning. And he was having a really hard time with being away from me. I tried again at three. And I remember his teacher telling me that he was telling her, he was like, um, she asked him if he was having a good day. Cause he seemed kind of sad. And he was like, it's really hard being away from home, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so that was kind of the last, that was the last time before I moved here to Washington in 2019, I ended up putting him school for six weeks before the lockdowns into kindergarten. And that was the last time that he's been in school. (laughs) So, yeah. So we've, we've tried a few things um, to say that I've been like strictly unschooling for whatever amount of time isn't exactly accurate, but for mm-hmm. the most part, that's what we've been doing. How do you, how do you manage the expectations from say the state of Washington or your local school district or whatnot? How do you measure success? You know, do you do it against the state standards? Do you do it against other types of standards? What, what is your rubric for knowing that something's going right? That's a great question because I think when you're doing something unconventional, you need to have unconventional standards. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) So, you know, my standards have to do with 
my goals for this, right? And I hadn't really thought about this until somebody asked me the other the other day, but my main goal, my main wish for both of my children is that they end up with the confidence to know that whatever they want to find out, they can go and find out, like that they have the capacity, the skill, the intelligence to seek and find information that is valuable to them. And when, when they're able to do that, the sky's the limit, right? Because information, I mean, especially in, in our day and age, if you have the, if you know how to seek out information, you're, I mean, that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty amazing skill that I don't think I acquired from high school. <laughs> um, because the standard was like, what, what information, you know, or what information you've learned, which is often not even retained, you know? So like, if we look back on, yeah, I learned a ton in elementary school and middle school and high school, but what do I retain of it? And in my mind, the stuff that I retained was the stuff that was interesting to me. So why not just let people decide what's interesting to them? and allow them to explore that. And what you find is when children are allowed to explore the things that are interesting to them, at least what I've found with my kids, is that they end up knocking out the other standards as well. So an unschooled child might learn to read a little bit later on in their life, but they, they do, you know, because we live in a literate society and it's, it would feel pretty you would feel pretty excluded if you didn't know how to read and write, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you have parents that read and write and we, you know, just basic, you know, basics like feeling empowered to know that you just passed a pizza restaurant, (laughs) you know, you, you could now read it. You don't have to take my word for it that, or like a bakery or something. It's like, you know, you can easily fool your three-year-old who's not reading into passing by, uh, I don't, you know, the bakery, for example, and be like, Mm -hmm. oh no, that's, you know, that's a laundry, (laughs) that's a laundry place. But when (laughs) they're able to to read bakery, it's like, can we go in for a cookie? You know? (laughs) So there's, there's definitely a motivation from the child's perspective to want to know how to read. It just has, it's just a question of what is going to motivate them. So for my son, it was, and it's not like I was seeking this out because again, I was like willing to trust the experiment to a certain degree, but he learned how to read from the necessity of needing to read to play Minecraft, which I'd heard about. Yeah. yeah we've heard about it. <laughs> we've as heard well. a number of people say the same thing that that kid was really into like a specific video game and they got the, the book and that's yeah. how they did it. Right. Right. So that was, that was pretty shocking to me because one night he was just like, I want to read. I also read to them. You know, I think that that's important. It's unschooling is not the neglect of your children <laughs> to let them forage in the woods, you know. Um, <laughs> but so I will read to them at night is when we tend to to go through books, and they, I mean, they love that, and they're seeing words obviously, and they're hearing me read them. So I think there's a combination of a few things that go on. But I would say those are my standards, but also the ones that I mentioned before. It's like you know, do I notice that you're in are able to engage with human beings in intelligent conversation. That's really wonderful to me because I know children that know a lot of things that can't have conversations with people or feel intimidated to have conversations with people. I mean, barring the fact, you know, barring like extreme shyness, I guess, but the willingness to discuss ideas. And having an active literacy as well. I've noticed that as our daughter who's six, she's, you know, just starting on that journey of reading and she's starting to get to the point where she's sounding out words and she knows that that word sounds wrong and mm. it's helping her, you know, discover, oh, I made a mistake, you know, in that letter or what, whatnot. And, you know, you're right that this, you know, having these lively children that, you know, engage and talk and, and have this, you know, a huge vocabulary, I think is just, it pulls yeah. up their skills as reading <laughs> right along with it. It's right. yeah. Well, and, and letting kids 
read what they are interested in mm-hmm. reading too, I think is so important. You know, as we look back in school and we, we can kind of both pinpoint like the year that we stopped enjoying to reading and we didn't pick up reading again until we were adults out of college yeah. because the books that they made us read were so uninteresting to us mm-hmm. that, you know, sometime That's in elementary school, point. you just like, oh, I don't, I don't like to read. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, all these books that I missed because they were making me read things that, you know, I didn't want to read. It wasn't interested in because that's what the school district said. Every, you know, every seventh grader reads this book. So we all did, right. you know, but I, I like the idea of encouraging our kids to be able to, you know, find something that they love and dive into it. And for nobody to tell them that that book is lesser than yeah. some mm-hmm. other work, you know, like who grades that? Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question to you. We, we ask this question a lot to a lot of people we interview. You know, we have stay-at-home moms. We have stay-at-home dads like myself. Uh, we have working moms. We have working dads. You are a recording artist. Mm-hmm. How do you balance homeschooling with being a recording artist and the creativity and the creativity that's needed for that and maybe the time that's needed for that? I'm, I'm almost inclined to say not very well. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, you're like us. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that I've found that, that beautiful balance yet, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I, I have now, um, because I'm divorced, I, and I have a, a partner that I, that I live with, my kids are sometimes with their dad. And so those would be the like epic moments that I would, you know, try to, squeeze the most creative juice out of probably, Mm -hmm. but on a, you know, I can, I can play piano. I don't often find myself inspired to write a song lately when I'm doing kids all day. If I'm by myself, you know, like I said, if they're with their dad, then there's a little bit more space for that. But yeah, the, the recording thing is definitely not something that goes super well with having your kids home all day. (laughs) (laughs) So when I have done it, it's been like when they're asleep at night and uh, that, that seems to, to work. Okay. Do you find that during the day you're able to maybe spend more time, you know, thinking about what you might want to do planning for it because your kids are so interested in, you know, the things that they want to learn that they're, are they learning somewhat independently or do they need a lot of oversight and help from you? That's one of the metrics too, I guess, that I use too, is like how impressed I am by their ability to entertain themselves and find things for themselves to do. Mm -hmm. Because I think that was something that I was robbed of as a child with just too many organized activities. Um, And to my mom's credit, I think she didn't push me to like, you know, I wasn't one of those kids that was like, in soccer five days a week or, you know, being like carded to activity after activity. But I think just, you kind of get used to being told like, okay, this is the project we're doing. And, and then maybe don't have such a great sense of how to use your free time. So I remember that feeling quite lost after college when all of that was done. (laughs) I'm like, wait a second, there's nobody, you know, I, cause I didn't go straight into a job. I'm like, there's nobody telling me what to do anymore. What do I do? But yeah, for the most part, they are very self-sufficient. And then the things that we end up doing together are like out of the house things. Like let's all go to the park or let's go, you know, get some food or, Hey, do you want to go to the grocery store with me? So, so I had a question, you know, you know, we've talked a little bit about what your day looks like, but like, could you walk some people through people like to always see you know, see it in action or hear about it in action. Like what does a day look like for you guys when you're unschooling your children? I think that helps to dispel some, some of the myths around either, whether it's homeschooling or unschooling, the people who might be interested in it, they just need to see what it looks like. You know, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what is your morning routine? What does it look like throughout the day? Absolutely. One of the things that that's interesting that I will add is like a little sidebar before I do that is that it's always evolving. So I can tell you what it looks like right now, but it might be different in like a week when my kids are into something totally different. But um, so lately I have, we're, we're pretty late risers and late bed people. So lately they get up around 10 30 or 11. And for those of you going like, what? Like I try, (laughs) I've tried going to bed. I've tried the going to bed earlier 
I will um, neither confirm I, nor deny that Ariel <laughs> and I's eyebrows went through the roof. Our children are very early like toddler 30. Type you kids. know, and my kid, my oldest has always been like that. He's never oh. wanted to go to bed early and I'm not an early to bed person. So I would feel like a total hypocrite if I pressed it more than I, I have, but I do every once in a while, try to like push the clock or, you know, try to like, uh, gravitate it towards an earlier, whatever, but in any event, they're getting enough sleep. <laughs> they're getting a lot of sleep. Um, so yeah, so they get up and lately they get up and they don't wake me if I'm already sleeping. And I tend not to wake them up if I get up before they do, unless it's getting to be really crazy late because I don't want them to go to bed even later than we do. So they wake up, they, you know, they brush their teeth and they do their thing. They might grab their switch or their, um, instead of like a tablet, they have a little, I got them like phones, but without phone numbers, mm. my son wanted that instead of a tablet. So got them a used telephone or a, you know, a smartphone. Um, they'll, I guess, kind of catch up on whoever they're following on YouTube for, for maybe a little bit. And then they'll come down and have some breakfast. My five-year-old is in the habit of making himself his own cereal. <laughs> so he'll pour his cereal in his milk and whatever. And yeah, that's kind of the, 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 the undefined morning, which, you know, tends to, to drag into the, the afternoon. And then if it's a day where my son has a lesson of some sort, he takes an online Japanese class, which he elected to do. And he does drums um, at the local guitar center. Then I will take him to that. My youngest may or may not come. And then if we decide to do something afterwards, maybe get like food or go to the playground or something, we might do that. Maybe I come back and I grab both of them and we take a walk and they, they really love like playing in, in our woods and like, and the, the playground and whatever. They don't generally do much with the equipment, but they, they'll play like, uh, I don't know. They'll, they'll actually kind of pretend play sometimes the video games that they're playing. So like, you know, they'll pretend that they're Minecrafting or, I don't, I don't, I can't even, I can't even remember, but they, they, they like hitting things. So they'll find like sticks and anyway, um, stuff like that, just like, you know, playing with the, the dirt and the elements kind of thing. And then we might come home, we'll make dinner. They are in the habit of, of watching something, um, you know, at night. It sort of depends. If I ask them to go clean their playroom or their room, then they might just end up playing for a long time. Cause, and that's one of my tricks too, is like, I, I don't censor the screen time, but if I feel like they haven't moved their bodies in a while, I guess that's my other caveat, nutrition and exercise. Um, then I will suggest to them that they, <laughs> that they go do something else because I think, um, it is a good reminder and it's not a non-issue that <laughs> being sedentary is not good for your health. Yeah. So, so something like that. And then, you know, it, it really depends on the day. It's like, if my son wants to play a board game or my, or my youngest wants to, he, he is actually much less, he's grown up with me being very lax about the screens, but he's way more interested in be in doing projects. So he, you know, he's like, he wants to get the hot glue gun out. He wants to cut paper. He, but he usually wants me to make him something like, like during the lockdowns, I must've made like 30 Muppet replica puppets <laughs> <laughs> out of cardboard. I don't, um, Cause we used what we had, but that sort of thing. So it, it definitely is not like a, a, one day looks like every other day. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the most common thing is our, our mornings usually look the same um, day, day in and day out. It's just what happens afterwards that has been fairly flexible. No, that, that's, that, that's really interesting. Um, how much is your musicality? Like you said, your son was taking drums. Um, how much of that comes through in, 
in what they're interested in or do you teach to them you know music and 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 songs and is music a big piece of their lives because of what you do I actually think that they've resisted it more okay because it's what I do the reason my son wanted to do drums is that we went to guitar center one day on a whim I don't remember what we were looking for but he saw the drum kits and I mentioned to him that he could take lessons if he wanted. And he was like, yeah. So, <laughs> Well, they do look pretty cool. Yeah. So it might be because he knows that, you know, music careers are a possibility because that's what his mama does, okay. possibly. But it also just seemed like he thought the drum kit was cool. My youngest is really interested in my keyboard. And he'll probably end up taking piano lessons or guitar lessons because he's expressed interest in that they just won't take him because he's five so. right we've had the same problem our daughter is interested in things but you know at her age they just don't they don't offer that um so it's really great that you know you, you're able to find something that your son can do and hopefully your younger can get into something soon so um we talked about the things that they want to do do you have concerns at some point about the things that they might need to, to learn to keep up? And we've got, you know, here in Washington, we have to do the 11 subjects. And, you know, are you are you concerned at some point that they'll be like, no, nah, I'm just not interested in math and that you'll have to push that? Or so far, have they, you know, naturally taken up all the subjects you would need for them to do anyway, one way or another? I have to be honest, because my son only turned eight last year. February. I haven't done a ton of research into that. And where we were before in Arizona, there wasn't that stipulation. So I may have to read about that. Um, my oldest though, is at a point where I can go, listen, this is what we need to do. And here's why. And he'll be like, oh, okay. You know, so I'm sure we could find a compromise for something if that were a necessity or we were missing something. Mm -hmm. for the law. <laughs> but, you know, as for my own concerns about it, it's, it's, it's kind of a non-issue to me, to be honest, because I learned so many things. I, I didn't learn so many things, let's put it that way, in high school and middle school that you probably did, because I grew up in a foreign country. And even though I have no American history, like I have zero American history, I don't know any of it. Um, except for what I've heard on the news since, you know, becoming an adult. Um, and I haven't found that that's, you know, hindered me very much in my life. And I also don't know, I don't know or remember anything about chemistry. <laughs> I don't know or remember anything about physics. Um, but, you know, I still know not to like drop something heavy on my toes, you know, oh, sure. um, yeah. So I feel like the things that, you know, and this might be a naive thing and I might, you know, decide that, that there's merit in looking into alternate solutions too, as we go forward, because my kids are eight and five, you know, so we're not like deep into the, the wilderness in us yet, but I'm, I'm kind of just, um, I would be excited to discover those, <laughs> those things and try to troubleshoot that with my kids. I don't see that as a potential problem. I see that as possibly something interesting actually. So it's more, it's more of a perspective change as opposed to fearing the unknown. You're, you welcome it as a challenge to, as a learning opportunity. Yeah. Because ultimately, I mean, we don't really know what our kids are going to need. Not really, you mm -hmm. know, like when I was a like there are kids that my, my kids watch. And I know this because they watch them who are making millions. This is their career making YouTube videos. I know. Yeah. How That's could amazing. we have known when we were kids that that would be a career option? <laughs> so I'm sure that by the time they are come of it, I mean, there's just going to be things that we didn't even consider as, you know, potential um, things that they could not just survive on, but thrive on. So I think to pretend to know what, you know, what they're going to need beyond like, you know, shelter food, <laughs> you know, <laughs> obvious things like <laughs> going to go like, I'm not so sure my kid needs water, but you know, trigonometry. I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah. It's, an, it's, it's interesting the, you know, what is really useful. And, and like you say, what do you remember? You know, Matthew and I've had this conversation many times about the highlights that we remember from elementary school and they are few and they are usually like projects or events or something we did. We don't remember science lessons from elementary school and that kind of thing. Right. So I, I think that's really, I think it is insightful to say, you know, what, what's going to really stick with them and what's just like rote knowledge just to give them this information that they're going to then purge because they didn't care anyway. Right. I mean, one skill that I did get from school that seemed really useless at the time, but I find really useful now is actually the tool of memorization. That's a great skill to have. Mm, And it's, it's something that my oldest has taught himself because he's wanted to memorize like TV shows or something. So I, I find that interesting too. I, I wonder whether the things that that's sort of my, my prayer too, is like, I, um, not in a religious, not in like, I don't, um, but you know, like my, the, the thing that I am instilling the, the little hope diamond that I'm instilling in, into my children is like, I feel like they're going to know the things that are going to be useful to them because they're going to have that spark within them you know, it's like that innate spark in us that is the reason why I do music, you know, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was calling me. And, and I think the, the least, you know, if we do nothing else, the least we could possibly do is just not kill that for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's things that they discover themselves that they're interested in. And then I imagine that there are things that you think that they would probably dig. Um, how do you present that? Do you get books from the library, strew them around carefully so that they may stumble <laughs> upon them? You know, do you watch a video, say, hey, I, I, you know, maybe we could learn about this thing. Let's watch a video and see if you guys are interested. Or, you know, how do you how do you present new topics? Because I feel like my our daughters and many kids would not know the things that they might really be interested in just because, you know, how much they know of the world and of things that they could study. Sometimes we give something to her and say, Oh, we're going to learn about this. And she's like, we can learn about that. That That's awesome. (laughs) So how do you present things to them? That, yeah, I love that. It's a great question. Um, the strewing thing, uh, was something I read about too. That hasn't worked out so well for me because my kids don't, tend to notice the like like the books and things around the house tend to become sort of like furniture that they don't notice anymore (laughs) so they're not so much like thumbing through things and like scavenging our house I haven't found that that that's a super effective method for us Um, but so like for example I really feel like it's important for them to um be with other kids right now, like just to have any sort of social interaction, I feel like is pretty positive because they've been really missing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we moved here at like the worst possible time. So we haven't had really an opportunity to meet anybody. So anyway, we, we met up with someone. uh, I decided that we were going to go meet someone at a park and basically just like told them, Hey, we're going to the park. (laughs) And I got them in the car because ultimately I knew that they were going to like, that that was going to be a nice experience for them. But you're right. Like if I had gone, Hey, so I really think it would be a great idea for us to meet this random person that you've never met before at a park. Um, I'm thinking about writing his mom back. Like, what do you think? Like that just wouldn't have probably gone very well because I think they would have gotten anxious about it. So there is that, there is that fine line about like realizing that they also are kids. And, you know, like you were saying that they don't know about all the possible options that are available to them or what they might like before that they do it. So yeah, there is an element of, I wouldn't say trickery, but like marketing, (laughs) (laughs) marketing. I like that, (laughs) that, you know, maybe I would want to do to start something off, you know, like, Hey, wouldn't it be fun to go to a, you know, like my kid, my, my youngest was doing swim lessons. Like, wouldn't it be fun to go and like be able to swim in a pool, you know, at, because maybe he, you know, if I said, Hey, I just signed you up for swim lessons, you know, he, he would fight me on that, but then he has a great time. So, so then it's sort of self, it's sort of self-feeding, right? Because then they become, then they realize what they 
they could get and they do it. And this is blown up in my face too. I mean, sometimes they don't like it at all. And I'm like, sorry, (laughs) I tried. One of the most important learning tools that I have utilized actually, and it was also from reading Sandra Dodd. I think that's where the strewing thing comes from maybe, or maybe she got them from somebody else, but is that just talking to your kids. I think this is something that we really overlook as homeschoolers, maybe like we don't give ourselves enough credit for, but having a conversation with your kid when they ask you a question and being curious about what they asked and going like, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let's look it up. I mean, we've learned so many things that way. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know that I'd never thought about why Washington was named Washington. So we looked that whole thing up and it was, that was super interesting. So I, I will also say that when things get brought up to kind of seize those moments for um, the seeking of information, because if you're, I mean, ultimately, if I'm not willing to learn something, then I'm not exactly modeling, you know, what I want to see, um, in my kids. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's totally true. We go down a lot of rabbit holes for better or worse. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> they lead us to large scale art projects. We were not planning to do that day. <laughs> <laughs> our daughter is also a let's make things um but really you make things for yes, me to yes, play with know. and they're always very <laughs> complex and large always. they're always large um so we, we've talked about unschooling and that methodology but I want to touch on another part you do some road schooling you you live part of the year outside the U.S. right yeah that's that's the path our life has taken recently yeah so how does, how does homeschooling go, go with you? How, how do you, uh, you know, I don't know if you have a homeschooling space at home. Do you, do you take supplies with you? Do you just, you know, how does that work transitioning and living for part of the year in, in another place and continuing your homeschooling journey? Well, I actually, one of the reasons I really love travel and I wanted to travel with my kids is specifically the disruption of routine. I, I really, I, I don't know, maybe that's like a, a disease that I have or something, but <laughs> there's only so much, there's only so much of the same thing that I can take day in and day out. Mm-hmm. And, and I find that really positive in their lives too. You know, if they, if they're in the habit of doing something specific every day, and then you take them to a new place and they have to kind of figure out how to navigate that, that arena that's like all education in itself, you know? So I, I tend to take minimal, I should say, I tend to take, I, we've done this once. Um, we went on a trip to Europe a couple of years ago and that's when I was still married and we just recently got back from Mexico. So, you know, we're, we're going to be going back and forth a little bit from Mexico because that's where their dad lives, but I'll take some art supplies for my youngest because I know that that's necessary. And I take, I, I, you know, I take my bind, the binder for my son's Japanese and drum lessons, cause he can do those online. And that's kind of it. I, Oh, you know, last time I wish I had brought some more bedtime books because that wasn't easy to find in Mexico, but yeah, basically, basically we go with pretty minimal supplies and then we we make do with what's there and that has its pros and cons, but, um, we discovered some pretty cool instruments in Mexico that we, uh, you know, acquired and became toys. And yeah, they had, they, they have different, you know, there's different amenities when you go other places and there's different, um, different routines that develop. So like, you know, we don't go to the beach on a daily basis while we're in Washington, but that was something that they would do a lot with their dad. And so they, they actually, um, this was really cool too. my, my older son, who's always had a a fear of like going up to waiters or people in stores. He always wants me to be the intermediary for him. And I'm like, you can just talk to them. He totally overcame that. And is like, you know, friends with, you know, cause, cause we'd be going to the same restaurant every day where they would, you know, became friends with one of the waiters and felt totally comfortable, you know, just walking up to the bar and asking for more limes or, or, or whatever. So, yeah, I think 
uh, I think the supplies are kind of the environment, you know, in, in that for me anyway, for, for that, uh, experience. So do you, when you're in one of these, these new countries, do you, do you just dive into the culture? Do you try to make that part of the learning of, are you trying to learn some of the language with them or yeah, how do you, how do you seize the opportunity of this change of location to, to infuse extra, you know, extra learning that you couldn't do in the U S that you, you can do there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they, unfortunately the place that we are going to be visiting in Mexico is very highly expat. So there's not a ton of opportunities for the necessity of speaking Spanish. I do speak some Spanish, but, um, so my kids learned a few words that they needed. Um, one of the interesting things that I, and again, this is like a tangential thing, but relates to what you said is the, the kind of the lost art of observation. I think that because of the way the school system is designed to kind of tell you what you need to know at all times that there's not a lot of like, if you've ever read that free to free to learn book by Peter Gray, he, he goes into this really beautiful explanation of how in hunter gatherer cultures, the children would mimic the activities of the adults and that's how they would learn to do them. You know, they would like pretend play uh, grinding spices or weaving baskets or whatever they were doing, but they weren't being told how to weave the basket. They were relying on their observational skills. And that's really, that's really interesting to me when we go to another culture, because um, yes, I, I definitely want to point out things and um, expose them to things that you could not otherwise do here. But I also find it so interesting to hear what they're observing. And I'm also, I'm usually pretty impressed by what they're observing. Yeah. It's really interesting to, to see, you know, what sparks our kids interest. I think that that's really, um, yeah, that, that's something I'm, I keep thinking about, you know, this is probably the, the third or fourth unschooling interview we've done. And I, <laughs> you know, each time I kind of like get a little bit more mm-hmm. on board to, you know, how can we, you know, if not completely doing that in our homeschool, how can we adapt some more of these principles? Because I, I love how um, natural and naturally joyful mm-hmm. unschooling uh, seems to be. Because we see it in our, in our kids, in our kids' eyes when they're getting into something that they really, really enjoy. Yeah. Just, and it's just, just a wide. It, it's wonderful. It's, it's the reason that we do all of it. So this has been wonderful, but before we close, I'd love to hear do you have something that you would want new homeschoolers to know or something that you wish you knew when you started? We, we always ask this question and I love, we almost always get different answers. And I think they're all like, what's your nugget of wisdom you'd want someone to, to take away who's thinking about uh, homeschooling? I'd say to relax. That's something that I wish I had known was okay from the get go because I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as parents in general, but especially when we're kind of taking our children's education into our own hands, you don't have to get it all in all at once. You know, if you decide decide to unschool, you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to unschool. I mean, it sounds like your daughter is very happy doing what you're doing right now. So, you know, don't, um, what what do they call it? Don't fix it if it's not broken, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I, I do what I decided to do what I did because it worked for my kids. And I think that's really the best thing that we can do as parents and as homeschoolers. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Thanks so much for spending time with us and and helping us understand what you're doing. I think the unschooling thing is always super attractive to a lot of homeschoolers. I think we try to always trend in that direction because we understand what it is and we're always fighting against our desires to have them learn X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is nice to hear, you know, you know, kind of a, a recheck on who, what, why all this is important, which, yeah, is, who this which is for. yeah, this is for the kids. So it is always great. So thank you so much mm-hmm. for sharing that with us. And this was great. Could you maybe 
you know, give some links and, and, and information on your podcast and what you do um, on the side. Maybe if you'll come find you yeah, and make sure, make sure to put the links into the show notes as well. Yeah. And this was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you again for inviting me. And I can't wait to listen to your other episodes. This, this sounds, uh, sounds like I should be listening to your back episodes. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a porter singer.com right now. Um, that's my website. And I have done music as Porter Singer, but that's fairly new. I was doing music under the name Sirgan Carr for a very, well, for eight, nine years. And that's where my main following kind of stems from. I did music in the yoga mantra genre. So um, that was, that was fun. And then I was kind of done, or maybe I'm just on break I'm not sure and yeah I have a podcast called inspired artist podcast which basically started out as um, just wanting to record in uh, conversations with my friends but has grown into something a little bigger and um, it's always fun to have a project that you didn't expect to take off kind of take off so I know nothing about this Uh, well awesome we'll we'll make sure to include all that in the show notes below and hopefully people can go listen to your music and and check out your podcast if that interests them thanks so much again yeah thank thank you. you thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey please engage with us on social media join our homeschool together podcast group on facebook and find us at homeschool together podcast on instagram We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!